Oh. <laughs> <Hi>. <laughs> oh, can you hear me on the microphone? Yes. Yeah, okay, you can hear me the whole time. And the no underwear part. Um, welcome to the AMC last plenary of the day. <laughs> AMC 20, thank you for being here bright and early at 3 p.m. on <laughs> Sunday. <laughs> bright and early for me. Um, we're so grateful that you all are here, so grateful to the AMC um, for having us. Um, this is Performing New Worlds, um, and I'm so honored to be um, here with these panelists. They're like each one, I, I know two of them and I know your work now, um, and they're incredible visionaries, artists, people, and so I'm so excited. Um, what we're gonna be doing is I'll introduce them. Everyone's going to talk a little bit about their work, and, um, and then we're gonna have a conversation in our living room, and then open it up to our larger living room, and then we'll close it out and get to closing ceremonies. So that's the order of what we're gonna do. Um, great. Are you, who are you? Oh, hey, thanks. <laughs> Um, I, uh, my name is Una Aya Osato, and I'm a performer, writer, and educator from New York City. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Oh, that's me. No, okay. Uh, <laughs> and next up, we have, um, <clears throat> <laughs> I just get so nervous. <laughs> I perform like every day, and each day I'm like, <laughs> But I'm um, so, so glad to share my anxiety with you all. Um, next up, uh, we've got R R Ricardo Gambo. Gamboa. Gamboa, yes, thank you. Um, <laughs> Gamboa. Um, uh, uh, he's an award-winning artist, activist, and academic working um, in, in his native Chicago and New York City and um, creating radical political work. You'll hear Malik Brown in a second. We've got, yes, please give it up. Thank you. Next up, we have Sandra Ibarra. Yes. yes. Good job. Um, um, she's an Oakland-based uh, performance artist from the US-Mexico border who sometimes works under the alias of La Chica Boom. So give it up. Yeah. Next up, we've got Francesca Fiorentini. Okay, yeah. Um, she's a journalist, a comedian, and an activist based in the Bay Area. Yeah, give it up for Francesca. <laughs> yes, and they're all gonna tell you more about their work, and i um, so excited. Um, and um, Aya Simone was going to be on this panel, um, but she wasn't able to be here. She's been doing so much at the AMC this weekend. She co-hosted the opening. She's got a new film, um, so she's not able to be here, but we, we love her and appreciate her. Um, and so, yeah. Um, okay, it's better when I talk like this. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> This is, yeah, this makes me less anxious. Well, I'll do it. <laughs> Everybody. Okay, I'm gonna put it in my cleavage. Oh, yeah, yeah, better. Okay, okay, okay. Um, <laughs> all right. Um, so we're gonna just talk each a little bit about the work that we do um, to have some context for the conversation that we're gonna have all together. Um, so my name is Una Aya Osato. I'm gonna go first, and yeah. Um, I am, a, as I said, a performer and writer. Um, that's me in a new show that I write solo performances, um, uh, focusing on uh, lived experiences of mine and those around me. Um, especially highlighting marginalized communities that are usually excluded from theater worlds. Um, so this is an image from my newest show called With You, which is a queer sports rom-com. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. I did it at the AMC last year, and it was really fun. Um, and uh, so yeah, I have five solo shows, and I toured them. OK, cool. Um, I also am a burlesque performer, and um, thanks. Um, I go by the names of Exotic Other, and really sexy, um, and Norms. Um, and I'm really excited about looking at how um, the things that are like dumped upon us and our bodies, and um, 
bucking with audiences' expectations and notions of who I am and getting to literally strip away all the bullshit and be like, it's ours. Um, so this is a, a baggage piece that I do. Um, <laughs> And I'm also a hoarder. So, okay, um, I'm also a clown. Um, and uh, I, <laughs> thanks. Um, this is at the Women's Day protest. Um, uh, my sister and I have a clown. My sister's name is Michi Ilono Sato. Yeah, AKA Sister Selva. And um, she's my main co collaborator. Um, so, you'll see her in some images. Sister, I hope you're okay. Hey, sister. Yeah, okay. Um, so we do a clown act um, called the White Shirts, where we're clowns who arrest people at protests. Um, and this is from the Women's March, so we are arresting people who maybe were too liberal or um, didn't understand intersectionality. Um, and uh, we like to like kind of like, you know, add some play and fun and, and questions into what normally could just be like, we're here, we're here, we're here. What else are we doing? Um, okay, and that's my sister. Um, and so we also do performances out in the streets. Um, and this is from a performance that we did on January 20th, the inauguration day. Um, us and about 100 other witches in New York City gathered um, to cast spells on the institutions that uphold racism every day, not just when Trump is in office. Um, so we visited some buildings, and I'm gonna show you a quick video of it um, and we co-created this piece sorry those um, we co-created this piece with um, Morgan Basakis um, yes if you know Morgan you know um, with uh, Craig Willis Caitlin Nose and Tuesday um, and okay that's us yelling at ice um, and here's gonna be a video okay go yes we were celebrating you. <laughs> um, hmm. Our mothers all were witches. Our mothers all were witches. Our grandmothers were too. Our grandmothers were too. Don't threaten our communities. Don't threaten our communities. Oh, we'll be coming right for you. Oh, we'll be coming. that um, piece from a, a, a workshop we were inspired by for the Center for Creative Activism. Um, we developed some strategies and took to the streets. Um, okay, and so we also have a burlesque company um, called Brass, which stands for Brown Radical Ass Burlesque. Um, yeah, in New York City. Um, we did this photo shoot at like one in the morning on the subway trains and no one gave a shit about what we were doing. Um, <laughs> 
So that was funny. We're like, uh, outdoor performance, and everyone's like, whatever. Um, so, oh, yeah, okay, and we have other personas. So that's Sister Selva, <laughs> a.k.a. Lil Willie. Um, I'm Exotic Other, a.k.a. Norms, and that's Miss Aurora Bubrealis, a.k.a. Don Dick Realis. Um, and uh, we started this company uh, a, a few years ago um, because we really wanted to center um, politics and performance and um, center queer queer femmes of color um, and politics in our performances. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. Uh, or, yeah, just going through it. So we uh, have, we create shows and um, we create space. Um, we started doing this monthly show called Compost Bin, and um, it's a radical ass cabaret to deal with the world. And so we use our art um, to compost what's happening in the world um, and to create space these are just some cast photos. <laughs> they're amazing. Each cast, each month is a new um, group of people, and they're just like, every month, you're like, what? What? Um, so if you're ever in New York City, um, we perform at Star Bar every third Thursday of the month. Um, and uh, these are some amazing performers that have performed with us. Um, and so, oh yeah, here's a quick little video. Um, <laughs> compost bin. Okay. <laughs> um, it's my sister's butt. Um, and so our family comes to our shows all the time. Um, and it's, it's family friendly. Um, and <laughs> uh, so we create space so that we can like Get, get out all, and hold space with each other, like all the fuckery that's happening in the world, all the violence, massacres, um, and so we can make space for all, all the other feelings that we might have also, um, and be able to celebrate each other and our power and what it means to be with each other in real life. And I think um, the AMC has been an inspiration for us of what it feels like to be together um, and create a world and like feel it even just for like an hour. Um, so that's what we try and do in monthly. Um, and then uh, uh, this is, oh, okay. This is a song we wrote also around inauguration. And then we taught our audience. Fuck ice too. Too. If I was richer, would it be richer? If there was shit, like Yeah. Oh, so we do performances at our shows and we also um, brought the audience up to try and teach them this so that maybe we could do it at a protest together. Um, and my sister choreographed it. A, a group of us rewrote the lyrics. Um, and then that's our dad. He's gonna dance a little bit. Um, he's been to the AMC before, so he's been on this stage. Um, the three of us are clowns together. Uh, slingshot hip hop, you see it? Oh, he's gonna dance. Immigrants up, I'm like, fuck you and fuck you too. If I was richer, so would it be richer? White supremacy, shit. White supremacy, shit. Your people were illegal too. Natives didn't invite you. Fuck you. Uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so that's what we try and do in our shows. Um, this is a, uh, we recently were in the New York Times, um, yeah. which is wild. I've like tried to reach out to press for like years and no one's ever wanted to do a story on us. And then suddenly the Times was like, yeah, okay. Um, and Sandra was actually in it as our historian. Um, uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> She's a historian. Um, so anyway, um, that's our group and uh, some of the political artistic work that we do. Okay. Um, and uh, if you're interested, and we'll talk more about it later. And now we're going to talk to the rest of the panel. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yes, you're next. No, it's wrong. Oh, no, my name is spelled wrong on it, but it's okay. Oh. I'm Portuguese in this version. Oh. It's Gambao, but it's really Gamboa. Gamboa. Um, hey, what's up? I'm Ricardo Gamboa, or Ricardo Gamboa. Um, I'm uh, a radically politicized uh, arts uh, activist, academic, um, and culture worker. Sorry, I'm so used to like, talking directly to people, and the lights are off, and the lights are on, so I'm like doing this shit right now. <laughs> um, but uh, I was born and raised on the south side of Chicago, queer, genderqueer, and Mexican-American. I saw, anyone from the south side? Woo! Yeah! <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I'm here to talk about my, about my work. Most of the work that I've been making has been uh, outside, it's been radically politicized. And what I mean by that is not just in its content, but also in its form. So it was created uh, largely outside of institutions and outside of institutional support, outside of the mainstream culture industry, um, and or, uh, only in tactical engagement with the nonprofit industrial complex. Mm -hmm. um, and that includes everything from cultural criticism to uh, on my Facebook, um, or performance art interventions and viral media, plays devised with young people that were censored by the city, um, and also revolutionary TV, like uh, Blue Hood and uh, the Fudwazi, which we're gonna look at uh, right now. So before I get started, let me just break them down a little bit. Blue Hood is a web series about, uh, it's a web series about four gay Latino doctoral students that are also witches and trying to survive a witch hunt that's led by the, a secret society comprised of the straight, wealthy, white male descendants of the first New World colonizer. So. Yes. <laughs> My like running joke for the past few years has been, it's like people always call it a fantasy series, I call it a fucking documentary. Um, <laughs> And the Hood Wild is a bi-weekly live and live stream news show uh, that disseminates block optic and radical perspectives on culture, news, and, and politics. It occurs in a different gentrifying neighborhood uh, in Chicago every installment, and it draws out about at least uh, 100 people to each show, and then uh, hundreds more kind of tune in to our live stream. Um, I always describe it as like if the Jon Stewart Daily Show was hijacked by like radical uh, people of color, queers of color, uh, women and our, um, and our allies, and we brought along a DJ and a bar. Um, <laughs> so it's kind of a mix of party and pedagogy. We're gonna look at the trailer for Blue Hood and some clips from the Hood Wazi. So, show me. Thank you. <laughs> and now you press it again. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> culture and politics. I'm your host, Ricardo Gamboa, or Ricardo Gamboa. And tonight we're coming at you live from Blue Lacuna. A lot, a lot has happened since we were last here, a couple weeks ago. The Latino Caucus. <laughs> I'm like 1.5%. 1.5% of the population in um, Chicago is LGBT Latinx, right? So the idea is that it's the only time we're gonna be in the wrong percent. I know. <laughs> so it's like it just demonstrates how like representational representation is never really gonna save us. Can you tell us like uh, how you saw like the, the, the roots of this work and kind of how you saw saw it emerge in activist uh, movements and spaces and particularly around intimacy and intimate relationships? Right. So I went into feminism, especially domestic violence and sexual assault work. What you saw in the late eighties, early nineties was this attempt to. Like, because we have no language in this country for saying something is wrong besides saying it's illegal, like making fucking domestic, intimate partner, sexual violence, like the worst crime ever. In this, t in this time, when we look at movement work, and when you talk about lifting up the folks who are actually doing the work, we have to change our frame from this kind of patriarchal, uh, messianic, 
person who's gonna come through and start to bring saves, start to save everybody. It just won't happen. The reason you're an abolitionist, in my estimation, is because you are interested in a politics that get a, gets at the root of people's suffering. That's that's the main reason for being an abolitionist. You know, um, it's not anything else. Like it, yeah, it, it, all those things that involve also the ending of a carceral system, all those things around uprooting oppression, all those things are part of it. But ultimately, it's that you're interested in a praxis and a politics that gets at the root of people's sources of suffering. And so that means you have to do work with people, and that means you have to engage with people. And engaging with people is in itself fair. room and not alone throughout history. I'm a witch, and I believe that you are too. And I'm here to tell you, like Whoopi Goldberg and the ghost of Molly, you in danger, girl. Enough! But before I go any further, you can tell by those projects that like, I'm not the only one involved. In them, and that's what I love about media and filmmaking is that there's collaboration inherent to it. Inherent to it. So I want to give a quick shout out and thank you to my collaborators that are in the audience: Compton Kwashi, Amar Jean Christian, Daniel Kisslinger, Ellen Mayer, um, and also some of the people that you recognize from the conference that were uh, guests on the show, like Miriam Kaba, Soul Patches. Uh, let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> So I want to talk about both of those projects, um, each individually, and then kind of how I am understanding what I've learned from them and how they've kind of changed my work. So specifically with Brujos, right, part of what motivated that were these cries for representation. All the time when we talk about media, we frequently hear, we need more representation, we need more representation. But the reality is, is that although we do need more representation, we are living at a time of heightened representation, where there's more representation than there's ever been before in mainstream media. The issue is that so much of the representation at that time, even when it was people of color, were still normative people of color, or were still people of color kind of aspiring to like these neoliberal markers of success, like the normative family structure, or you know these type of middle class uh, mobility, uh, these type of middle class, upwardly class mobile, mobile lives. Um, so I kind of wanted to make a show that reflected so many of the people where I'm from. Right, working, uh, working class communities, uh, non-normative people, people of color. Um, it was also a response to shows at the time, because the idea was like almost a decade old, right, when I first started writing it. Shows like Girls and Looking, where it was kind of like these people living their lives out in, their ci out in the city and like in places like New York, where there's like people of color all over the place, but you wouldn't know it by looking at those shows. Right? Or these kind of like gay men getting their best life, but it was these white, upwardly homonormative gay men where I'm like, have fun at the gym and at Pride Parade. Um, so kind of what I wanted to do was kind of uh, push what we know as representation to kind of do more radical representation. Uh, and then the other thing I was really interested in was like, we always talk about social change media, but so often that means like the documentary. And so I was like, what does social change entertainment look like? What does social change TV look like? And how does it not just be some like didactic ass, 
You know what I mean? Like preachy as shit, but like stuff that is like my life, which is actually sexy as hell, which is queer as fuck. You know what I mean? Like, uh, and the one thing we know is like TV, it's never just like showing us things, it's showing us dreams, right? It's contouring our desires, right? So if you think about it, like from the 1950s to the 1980s, those sitcoms of the normative white family. And then when the 90s come and the 2000s, we see like, you know, the sex in the city, the friends, these single, uh, these single urban dwelling individuals that are getting their life through, man, through like how much they can consume and their luxury consumption. So I was like, if that's, and that inherently is teaching us trying to teach us something, trying to teach us what to want. And so I was like, well, how do we create radical pedagogy? And a lot of that kind of informed the content of Brujos, which is about four gay Latino doctoral students uh, that are uh, have to try and survive a witch hunt, and then start realizing that gay Latinos aren't the only people with magic, uh, and start teaming up with other people from, you know, uh, trans women of color, women of color, other non-normative people um, to take out the white supremacist patriarchal superstructure embodied by eight guys in suits. <laughs> so, so much of what I'm investing in is not just what you make, but how you make it. Um, and so that was kind of very much uh, with Brujos. It's a, it was an anti-institutional show. I didn't make a web series that I was hoping would just get picked up, get a cable contract. Uh, we actually made it completely outside uh, of the culture industry crowdfunded and then receiving some funding from grants, uh, from foundations that I could feel good taking money from. Um, and so, uh, and even how we, you know, we have the term parachute activism, but there's also parachute production when we're talking about film, right? Where people are like, Spike Lee, I'm gonna come in and I'm gonna give all these jobs to Chicago when I make uh, Chirac, which is whack as hell. Uh, but when I leave, I'm gonna take all the jobs with me too. And so, so, much of, so much of what we were trying to do is how do you do production that's actually sewn into communities and actually leave something behind uh, for community. Um, another thing we talked about was, in terms of representation, uh, was so often when you see these movies, especially if you're a person of color and they're like, oh wow, this new, this new show is coming out, it's about Mexicans from the South Side. And then you watch it and you're like, that motherfucker's accent is off. You know what I mean? You're like, you, you are not a Mexican from the South Side, right? And it's this idea though, so so much of what we were interested in was not about that type of representation, but self-representation because representation is always inherently problematic, right? Um, and so, we, so we, instead of just finding someone to play the thing, uh, which is already offensive in a lot of ways, we found the thing. So the woman that plays our afro uh mentor is actually, and then a Santera is actually an afro Poricua Santera that mentors younger brujos and brujas and, and that type of stuff. Um, and then a big other thing was non-hierarchical collaboration. So what that meant was so often when you go on a film set, it's like there's the, the producer, the director, the actors, and you're kind of all in the ADs, and everyone is, it's, it's, a, it's a pyramid power structure still. And so we were like, yo, this art is supposed to be where we, are, we imagine the world. Why are we still making shit the way they do there? Um, and so that just looked, meant that anybody was able to kind of collaborate. The actors were able to change their lines. Um, you know, if they, if they wanted to, were able to weigh in on, on, on their character. Um, but it also meant a radical vision. So, so often in film we hear the term kind of extra, and the idea that like these people are just walking in the background and they're extra, they're redundant. Um, but for us, we never, that wasn't, you know, we called all of our extras necessary. Because you need them to make the fucking shit. Take extras out of a TV show and look how stupid that looks and it's like two main actors in a cafe, right? So it's this, we took a All Lives Matter like to the coolest extreme. <laughs> um, and then the uh, Hood Was V, uh, which is that new show, was, uh, very, was very different, right? That came out of my being in academia. Um, I never thought that I would go back to grad school. I was like, fuck university, uh, you know, all this stuff. But it was uh, one, a survival thing. I needed to find a way to, to stay alive uh, for my PhD program, pays me to live. And then the other was, um, you know, and, and, and the other was I wanted to learn. Um, and so one of the things that why I wanted to make that new show was because when I was in academia, I realized that there is like mad books you could read about poor people of color or queers of color um, and you know, communities of color. The deal is the people that are living those lives are usually not the ones that get to fucking write those books, right? And so like how often there's all this discourse that affects our lives, but that those that are in the direct line of fire or harm are not the ones that get to author it. So um, part of what I was trying to do was create a new show that 
uh, you know, that was circulating in the hood, right? That was circulating on the south side of Chicago, on the north side of Chicago, in communities that were precarious and marginalized. Um, and again, so much of the media that we take, especially news media, is meant to inform, but I really am looking for media now that is not just, if I'm a progressive, I get to watch The Daily Show, you know, or liberal, let's not pretend. Um, you know, or if I'm a conservative, I get to watch Sean Hannity, right? Like, I'm also not just interested in this, like, old country buffet of perspectives that we can kind of consume, um, but also work that doesn't just inform and cater to our sensibilities, but work that transforms. And so one of the things that I kind of, uh, thought about was, cre was creating this new show that in which the audience wasn't just uh, spectators or consumers, but also participants. So frequently at the hood, while the audience members get up, they participate in the conversation. Um, it's a way of democratizing how we come up with truth, which usually for the past 500 years, the authority on truth and the arbiters of it has been white supremacy, patriarchy, elitism, things like that. Um, so I'm gonna skip ahead a little bit because I got like now 90 seconds. <laughs> So I think part of us, they're radically different projects, but part of, damn it, uh, but part of what they're unified by is that they both believe that our culture and media making is actually world making, um, and that they're not just, so often we talk about art and media in social movements, it's thought of as like this complementary shit, the shit that came after or that reflects it. But actually so much of what is the truth is that art, media, and culture has actually driven social movements, has been the engine of social movements, and has often anticipated them thinking in the civil rights movements, muralismo in the Chicano movement, performance in the Black Panthers interventions and protests. Um, another thing is they uh, both believe radical politics is not just the stuff that you put in the frame, but also the way that you operate and actually do production, that you embody your politics from conception to distribution. Um, they both are, care more about things than representational progress. They aspire to radical change. I don't want more diverse representation. I want total revolution. We deserve that. Um, and then they both uh, rely on queering and decolonizing media to uh, create alternative arts and media ecologies and in hopes to abolish the culture industry. And that last one I want to take really quick before I close out, which is so often we, can, we know, right, that like, these in, we, you'll hear it all the time, these institutions aren't made for us to survive. They're not made for us to thrive. Um, and we can point to something like prisons and say, let's abolish prisons, they confine our bodies. And we could point, I, my colleague David Sobel the other day was just talking about abolishing schools because they confine our minds. And yet, we never talk about abolishing the culture industry which confines our identity, confines our dreams, confines our perception, and we need to, right? And instead, what we do is celebrate any, any new instance of representation as though it's revolutionary. And usually it's not, it's bought. Um, and so again, right, part of what, uh, what, this, what this work is hoping to do is imagine what abolishing a culture industry would look like by creating our own alternative uh, media ecology. I have like pages more of shit, but I talk too damn long. <laughs> I'm out of time. <laughs>